Today we're here to welcome Stefan de Rink, who will be talking to us about his new book, Inside the Deal, How EU um, Got Brexit Done. And this topic, I think, I know sort of in America, we all know when Trump was elected. So sort of you know where you were or what you were doing when. And I think in the UK, but also in the European Union, everyone knows when Brexit happened what they were doing when Brexit happened. And what's wonderful about having Stefan here is that he was there not only when it was happened, but then throughout the negotiations step by step as Brexit got done. And the EU did not get undone, which was also one of the predictions. Once you get Brexit, UK out, which country will be next? Will it be France? Will it be the Netherlands? Will it be, and on and on. But none of that happened. And here, us, here to tell us the story is Stefan. So as a close aide to Michel Barnier, who served as the European Commission's head of task force for, for relations with the United Kingdom, uh, Stefan had a front row seat in the Brexit negotiations. Here he gives us the EU side of the story and seeks to spell some of the myths and spin that have become indelibly linked to the Brexit process. From the mood in the room to the technical discussions, he gives an unvarnished account of the deliberations and obstacles that shaped the final deal. And I'm, I'm sure that in the question and answer period, you will get insight into all of those things, even some of the things that may not be fit for print. Um, <laughs> so in any case, Stefan uh, Durink was a visiting researcher here at the Center for the Study of Europe in 2013-14. He has worked as an EU civil servant on financial regulation, the single market, transport policy, sustainable urban development, and on EU treaty changes. He has a PhD in political and social sciences from the European University Institute in Florence, and teaches at the Public Governance Institute at the University of Leuven in Belgium. So, without, oh, no, there's one other piece. You are, Stefan is currently, you're going to have to tell them, the permanent representative of the European Commission to Belgium. Did I get that right? Perfect. Okay. Very good. Okay, so over to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth, also for setting this up. Um, I'll talk about the EU's side of the Brexit story and the negotiations. But to kick us off, and Vivian reminded you, perhaps you knew where Trump were, or you, you knew where you were when Trump was elected in, in 2016. Um, maybe not everyone has followed Brexit. So just a very one minute telegraphic sketch. What happened is that there was a, a referendum by a member state which has always been an odd member of the European Union or an awkward member as one of the British academics, Stephen George, one, once called it. Not in the Euro, not in the passport free travel zone which we refer to as Schengen. Uh, Xavier Bettel, who was Prime Minister of Luxembourg up until a, a few days ago, said at some point during the negotiations they used to be a member with opt-outs, now they want to become a non-member with opt-ins. But it shows that as a member they were always a bit, they were not a regarded by Euro purists, I would say, as a full kind of enthusiastic and supportive member. And in that context, we had, there was a referendum. What I, I, I don't talk about British politics in the book unless it's important for understanding why the EU negotiated in the way it did or it, the approach it, uh, it adopted as EU, as, as EU negotiating team. But I still think it's important also to understand the EU and perhaps populism and different questions are still very relevant today, to stress that in my view, or in the view of British academics as well, this was not a popular demand to have a referendum. Right? This was partly this gentleman, David Cameron, who said my party should stop banging on about Europe at some point, and then decided a few years later that the country needed a referendum on Europe to decide whether it wanted to be in or out. Partly to reunite the Tory party and put that issue to bed, the Europe issue that, divides, that divided the Tory party. Uh, and also to respond to Nigel Farage, who had been very successful in the 2014 European elections as well, to avoid that pressure from the right on, on the Tory vote. So 
it's not a popular demand to have a referendum. It was a <coughs> party political driven process in my view. The other key figure comes a bit later, that's Boris Johnson, but again, Anthony Selden just published a biography on, of Boris Johnson. Anthony Selden is a biographer of British prime ministers, where he describes that Boris Johnson on the 24th of June, I think 2016, the morning after the referendum, was walking around in his boxer shorts at home early in the morning, uh, not fit for print, FFF, what have we done? There's no plan. <laughs> and Selden puts it in perspective as Boris thought Remain would win, Boris Johnson thought Remain would win, but by advocating the Leave vote, he would set him up, himself up as a most likely future Tory leader and therefore British Prime Minister. There was a lot of political entrepreneurship in, in, in all of this. There was also a masterful campaign, right, about taking back control, our money, our borders, our laws, our parliament, our parliamentary sovereignty, all that was part of the, um, of, of the equation. Um, we in Brussels were shocked, uh, and not just in Brussels, and it was a shock to the system and seen as a potentially existential threat, as you said, to the European Union. And there were all these words then on Nexit for the Netherlands, or Frexit for Le Pen and France, or Swexit for the Swedish extreme party that now supports a minority government, uh, and, and, and the Swedish exit from the EU. We took a very, we, the European leaders, and when I say leaders, I mean people like Merkel, Hollande at the time, French president, uh, Mark Rutte, minister president of, Fran uh, of the Netherlands, um, Renzi was prime minister of Italy. We took a, Rajoy in Spain, we took a conscious decision, all to, those people took a conscious decision to say, we will be under pressure when these negotiations start. Our basic position has to be, this is not our problem. Brexit is not our problem, it's a British problem that the British created for themselves. We will come under pressure to reform the EU to accommodate the new UK as a non-member. We're not going to play that game. We're not going to reform the basic principles of how the single market works, of how the EU institutional decision making works. This is not a collective problem solving of a problem created by the British. It's a problem that the British will have to solve. If I fast forward, there was this anecdote that Merkel at some point debriefed journalists on Chatham House rules about having met Theresa May. This was in Davos, where she was attending the, the World Economic Forum. And she said, Theresa came to me and says, Angela, make me an offer. And I'm like, Theresa, make you an offer. You're the one who decided to leave. I don't need to make you any offer. <laughs> you need to tell us what you want. So that was a, a very important principle of negotiations. And to make sure that that also happened, the second choice was crucial. And this is where Dan Barnier comes in, and I joined his team in October 16, when he started work, a few months after the referendum. Juncker decided to create the Commission president at the time, a structure in the Commission, and that structure would be the only structure dealing with Brexit-related issues. So the Department of Financial Services or Trade or Competition Policy or External Relations or Security or what have you would not deal with Brexit. Only Barnier and his team would deal with Brexit related issues. And the Council did exactly the same. The Council where member states are represented. They created a structure headed by a diplomat directly accountable to the, to the President of the European Council. Why? To avoid that Brexit issues would pollute the whole organization, if I put it like that. And it was quite crucial also for our negotiation approach. Um, the European leaders endorsed that structure a few months after its creation in the December European Council in 2016. And also committed themselves there that no one would negotiate with the UK and only negotiations would happen through that structure headed by, by Michel Barnier, which as you rightly said was called Task Force 50. Task Force for Relations with the UK. 50 refers to the article in the treaty that foresees how a, that a member state can and how it should leave the, the European Union. How is rather vague, that it can the, leave the European Union. So second thing is this governance structure. And the third thing was more controversial in the beginning, at least between us as a negotiating team and our principals, the member states, was to say, we're going to sequence these negotiations. We're going to talk about withdrawal only and the separation terms. And we're not going to talk about the new relationship until those separation terms are satisfactorily resolved. 
The two main ones in the beginning were the financial settlement, the money the UK owed to the EU. Theresa May told us in April 17, it's not a penny. The end result, seven months later, was a 45 billion euro financial settlement that the UK agreed to pay. And on citizens' rights, where Theresa May told us in April 17, before we started negotiating, UK migration law will apply to all the EU citizens who have come here, which is a huge decrease of their rights. Again, seven, eight months later, we satisfactorily concluded that. But why was this discussed with the member state as a negotiation approach was a high risk strategy? Because the UK had nothing to gain from this. They owed us money and they had to protect the EU citizens living in the UK, we said. So there was nothing in there for the UK. And some member states said, we may be setting us up here for no deal by going for that kind of strategy. And negotiation theory, that kind of sequencing, is often called a high-risk strategy. <coughs> but we said, for two reasons. First, we need to know if the UK is a trustworthy country after Brexit, if it's going to honour its obligations. But secondly, and more importantly, and then we're coming slowly to the unity of the EU that surprised so many people, we wanted to avoid that some capitals in the EU would be tempted to accept money in exchange for a better future relationship for the UK. That was our starting position on the sequencing, actually. We have to avoid that in the end game, money is still an issue. We have to settle the money question first, because that was, for many member states, a very sensitive question. Will I have to pay more? Will I receive less? Which is always a... And from the positive side, since no one wanted to pay more and no one wanted to receive less, we had to... <laughs> as EU get the financial settlement uh, in order, even though it was also a legally binding obligation on the UK under international law to pay its outstanding debts. So Brexit not being our choice, the governance structure and the sequencing were very important early decisions on our negotiation approach. On the future relationship, again, before Barnier took office, uh, the Brexit was not our problem motto, was from before Barnier took office, the sequencing was Barnier, but on the future relationship, before Barnier took office, people like Merkel and others had already told Theresa May, Hollande, you will not get single market participation if you don't accept free movement of people, which she said, I will not accept. Already in July 16, her first tour, when she was prime minister, became prime minister, went first to Berlin, then to Paris, she heard the same message. And all EU leaders said the same. The four freedoms are indivisible. Free movement of goods, services and capital is something you only get if you accept free movement of people. That was a very clear principle and a binary principle. You accept it or you're out of the single market. And so there's no cherry picking of the single market on financial services, which the UK is very strong in, as you know, and will also ask us some kind of beneficial treatment, basically. From the UK side, there was also an idea that we would have to create some kind of new union, I think, of 1 plus 27. And very early on, the leaders of the EU said, we're not going to compromise the autonomy of our decision making. But like on very important projects or economic issues, the UK was kind of, but we can still do, kind of create a new collective structure where we then manage the divergence between our regulations, or we can stay in Galileo, the satellite navigation system that the EU has put lots of money in with the UK. Let's create a new structure. And from the leader's perspective, this was a no-go area because this comes back to Brexit becoming our problem, basically, if we had gone down that route, reforming the EU for the sake of the UK, which is something we absolutely never wanted, wanted to do. As I said, by way of introduction, I don't speak a lot in the, well, I speak about British politics in the book, I don't analyze it because I'm not an expert on British politics. But if you allow me to indulge for a second in my personal work, <laughs> one of the things I had to do, or I, I wanted to do, and Barnier asked me to do during this uh, phase of the first two years, was to go to London very often, as the only member of the task force doing that, to talk to people in public or private Chatham House rules, experts or public <coughs> events. And so I got to know quite a bit of journalists also and, and experts and think tanks on, on in, who worked in London. And many people understood what was happening and that the EU was basically holding most, if not all, of the cards. But very influential journalists would say, well, yeah, you're saying that now, but in the end, you'll give us stuff, right? This is posturing as 
people do in negotiations. But last minute, as we all know, in the EU, there's always a compromise, right? So there will always be a compromise coming out. And journalists in Brussels, who were called by their desk or told their desk in London, like, the story you're running is very UK-centric. This is not what is happening in the negotiations. It's the situation is much tougher for the UK than the way our newspaper is depicting it right now. And the news desk would say, perhaps we don't know, but we don't care. This is the way we're going to run the story. And the anecdote I, I shared earlier with you is quite telling in that sense. A journalist from a broadcast channel who said, I, I know the UK doesn't have many cards in this, but I can't tell this to the UK public because I will not get the air coverage that I, that the broadcast space that I, that I think I should get. So kind of a sense of, has they to say, but a bit of entitlement, not from everyone, but from a part of Westminster and also from the part of Westminster in charge of representing the country and negotiating was at that particular time. Um, the story about last minute budging is also quite interesting because it also means the UK and the people who believe that misunderstood Brexit. Because by doing Brexit, the UK diminished its influence in the EU, obviously. And when the UK tried to divide the unity of the EU by working with some member states, it never led to any effect for the UK. Because nobody had an interest on the leader side in any of the 27 countries to break that unity. But still, the fact that the negotiation approach on the UK side was influenced or shaped by that thinking that in, there will be some last minute budging, an overestimating of the influence that the country had, that the country, or the position the country had put itself in. And so, brings me to my second last point, which is on the EU unity. Of course, it was easier for us to negotiate than for the UK because we were united and the UK was divided. So, in spite of the name United Kingdom, the UK was terribly divided, not just between Scotland and England, but also within the, the Westminster ruling class, so to say, and, and the Tory party was divided and they were in charge. The government of Theresa May was divided. So it was quite hard for UK negotiators in those conditions to negotiate. But where did that unity come from that gave us that comfort and that gave us a crucial tool for negotiations, which is patience, uh, which is a virtue in negotiations when you can use patience, uh, especially when the, the volatility of British politics was such that people were saying, we may have be heading for no deal, the UK is, 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 is directionless, doesn't know where it wants to go, where will this end? For me, the unity since 2016, and it's not just in Brexit, is partly drawing lessons from the divisions pre-16, the Euro crisis, migration crisis in 15 with the Syrian civil war, that clashes between member states. The clarity of our mandate was certainly crucial and the fact that we didn't descend into nitty-gritty details of sectors and financial sector energy, what do we do? So the high-level principles. I think a factor of unity on our side was that the governance structure I spoke about before and the fact that we in the Commission and the Council people became a symbiotic structure almost. We spoke almost every day to each other, pre-briefing, debriefing, which is not a normal way Commission-Council relations work, right? An unprecedented transparency on our side. We published all our position papers even before we sat down with the UK negotiators. This is how much money the UK owes us. This is what we think for citizens' rights. This is how we see the future relationship in terms of the economy, security, foreign and security, external security. This is how we see the situation. Partly, and we said, oh, this is about democracy, transparency. We need to make sure our businesses are informed, and that's correct, but was also partly to avoid manipulation of information by the EU, within the EU system, basically. And it was, to some extent, a strategic transparency to avoid that a prime minister in a country would, in the morning, see the Financial Times and discover what was happening in the Brexit negotiations, which is not something you wanted also from the viewpoint of, of unity. We needed this ownership and this buy-in, which, and then we come to Barnier as a person he is a politician who works with emotional intelligence, with personal contact, so he built up that trust with these prime ministers over time. And the transparency policy was also a, a tool to, to sustain that trust. 
That unity led to remarkable results, I would say, especially for Ireland. Because there were moments when no deal was not, un, was not unimaginable that it would happen because, because of UK politics mainly, or because of UK demands to us that were unacceptable, that we could never uh, entertain or, or accept. And in spite of all that, also when no deal came close because of Ireland and the lack of a solution for Northern Ireland, countries like Cyprus or Latvia or Slovenia said, that's cool. We only agree if Leo agrees, Leo being the Irish Prime Minister. We are united here and the UK is leaving, so we can't afford giving concessions to the UK if one of our members is not in agreement. And so Ireland, in that sense, played also a crucial role in the, in the rhythm of these negotiations. And in, when we couldn't find solutions for Northern Ireland initially, that also had a very important impact on, on those negotiations. On the flip side, I think the UK helped us also on the unity. <laughs> um, by threatening no deal, very early on, even before we started negotiations, Theresa May said no deal is better than a bad deal, five months before we negotiated. We analyzed that speech together with capitals, so we had like a hotline almost, and people said, well, what's going on? Why does she say that no deal is something they would consider? We haven't even started negotiating. So emotionally or psychologically, that was also not a very good thing from Theresa May's perspective to do. She then came around and her team engaged a lot with us, which led us to that first solution on Northern Ireland. Johnson was certainly someone who threatened no deal all the time and never followed through. I counted them in 2020. We had nine months of negotiations. He threatened four times with no deal. Um, the way we looked at no deal from the UK is a bit like this. <laughs> so we, of course, we, we considered no deal as a possible outcome and prepared for it, but not in the negotiations. What did the UK ever think it would obtain in the negotiations by threatening no deal? That we would say, oh, okay, then, then we'll give you this and that and that. Our res reputation as a negotiator was at stake towards member states and towards the international community because Washington and Beijing were also certainly watching this. Artificial deadlines, linked to that no deal, was also something the UK, Johnson especially, did a lot. And the most important, I think, mis the most important flaw, I would say, in the negotiation approach by the UK was this idea that you had to confront the EU to get something. And this is a story also of the level playing field in 2020, which is now in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. From the very start, and I come back to the unity, member states, Prime Minister, had told Barnier already in October 16, there'll be no trade agreement whatsoever if there are no level playing field conditions. So if there's no common standards on state subsidies to industry, because that will skew competition between the UK and the EU, and we're giving zero tariff, zero quota access to our market as EU. So we can't afford the UK subsidizing certain niche industries or, or, or sectors as a whole. Social, environmental, climate change costs in terms of industrial production. We need some common standards on a floor and on how we go forward in the future, basically. And sanctions in case the UK or the EU, in case the UK breaches those standards. From October 6th, the first conversation by Nihad was with Mark Rutte in The, the Hague. October 16, he said uh, there'd be no trade deal without level playing field conditions. Come back to the confrontation. When we sat down with David Frost, who was Johnson's negotiator in March 2020, although he had committed to, on paper, discussing level playing field guarantees that we were happy with, he ripped up that commitment in the first week and said only WTO commitments, which is basically nothing in terms of EU-UK relationship, that's, that's not something that member states would ever go for. And for eight months, the UK camped on that position, more or less. We don't give you anything on level playing field. Leave us alone, we're a sovereign equal. We don't want any legally binding obligation with you. Uh, and of course, you can't construct a new trade deal if you don't accept legally binding obligations. So yes, you're a sovereign equal, but we're constructing a new relationship. And my point is here that from a negotiation perspective, you would create a lot more value or influence, sorry, you would create a lot more influence for yourself 
as UK if you from the start offered something the, UK, the EU wanted. So rather than contesting to the other party in a negotiation like, you're asking me this but I won't give you, you're asking me the wrong things, you should ask me for something else. <laughs> You say, okay, why are you asking this? What can we do? How can we construct that? You only create influence or leverage in a negotiation by giving something that the other party values. People often see negotiations as a, as a kind of a struggle or as, a, as Boris Johnson would see as a kind of a boxing game or where there's a kind of win-lose situation, right? At the end, one is standing and the other one is down. Or, or the jury says, this one won. We saw it from the beginning as a lose-lose proposition. The mirror of a win-win classical trade negotiation. So for the UK, what we lost, they would win. And that negotiation tactic, for me, backfired. Then we had like four weeks to scramble to find a level playing field guarantees that would satisfy the member states. And since Johnson decided not to go for no deal, they were in a position where they only had one option, is to accept what the EU asked. And the same happened more or less on fishery, with some give and take, and also on level playing field, there was some give and take, I'm not saying that. But the macro picture that the UK put itself in a position of weakness as a negotiation party towards the end of, uh, of 2020. Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, this is, this is fascinating. You give us an inside view of the process. Um, so I, I've got two basic questions. One will be on particular policies to get us a sense of how, how particular, I mean, given some, but actually how that process worked. Um, uh, but before, I, before you do that, why were, the, why were the British so bad at these negotiations? <laughs> you know, they have the reputation of being some of the most um, rational, mm. focused negotiators. And this was, you know, basically a disaster. So mm. the question is, um, was this a kind of populist, they're more focused on the electorate, they're more focused on the so-called base, more focused on making comments to the British public mm. than actually getting the job done. Mm. I mean, yes, getting Brexit done, but you know, very poorly. So is it about populism? And, and, and in that sense, when you were talking and negotiating with some of these um, British leaders, did you... Were they actually talking to you, or were they grandstanding? Mm. I mean, was it a kind of a sort of the kind of populist grandstanding? We're not focused on you because you're the elite, and here we're talking an anti-EU system mm. kind of discourse, mm. or was it something else? Um, I think first of all, you have to. I, sh I wouldn't want to compare the capacity of the EU to UK negotiators too much, because they're two different political systems, right? Mm -hmm. And the UK, Theresa May had this election in June 17 and lost her absolute majority in Parliament. And then she composed a government of Brexiteers, anti-Brexiteers, and her party was also, her MPs, the ones who had to support her in Parliament, were also divided on the kind of Brexit they wanted, or some didn't want a Brexit at all. So she didn't have a majority and she had MPs who wanted a second referendum to overturn the first referendum. So politically she was in a very difficult position. That's one point to note. The civil service in the UK was incredibly rational and good. Those who have followed the negotiations may recall at some point a picture was tweeted out of Barnier and his two deputy negotiators with huge stacks of paper in front of them. And David Davis, the first of Theresa May's negotiator, with the ambassador and the lead negotiator next to him, and they had nothing in front of them. And this picture went on Twitter. And the UK actually asked to publish that picture, and it went viral, like, because the FT bureau chief in Brussels tweeted it first and said, ha ha, Michel, whatever would make you think we are not prepared. <laughs> 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 Michel Barnier. And it went just viral in the UK because it confirmed that kind of idea like we're going in there with these EU guys or EU people who are so used to negotiate 
And we haven't done this for so long, and, and our country is divided, which it was. Uh, and it was an unfair picture because the people who sat there knew very, uh, not talking about David Davis necessarily here, but, but uh, next, <laughs> knew very well the ins and outs of what was going to happen, I think. David Davis was certainly part of the Tory ministers who misunderstood the EU. They would say things, and many ministers in Theresa May's government, how complicated can it be to leave the EU? Because we're a member, we're trading with them, and the next day we're not a member, we're going to keep trading, right? But there is a single market with common rules and common institutions and, and accords and sanctions if you don't apply the common standard. So he would say, yeah, but the next day, how can we trust you? We can't trust. But yes, you can trust us. We, we've been a member for more than 40 years. But no, that's not how it works, right? So I think a deep misunderstanding of what the EU is drove also this process on the side of... And, and so that's then why if the civil service doesn't have a clear political direction, it can't perform. And you saw that in the Brexit negotiations, I think. Um, is it grandstanding? I think it was misunderstanding, basically, more than grandstanding, a deep misunderstanding of what the EU is and how it works. So populism is too simple an explanation. It doesn't work in the sense that you had mm. both the kind of, you did have the pro-Brexiteers anti-system, but you also had... I think that's interesting as a question because, again, I'm not an expert on British politics, but of course followed it very closely. and. I don't think populism drove the referendum results, but once the referendum was there, it changed the political identity of many people in Britain who said, I voted for leave, I won, this is now my political identity. You establishment, you need to deliver because this will make our country better. This is what I fundamentally believe in, as a certain voters. I think that then, of course, trickled up to to Westminster as well, where some people then said, it's so complicated, let's just leave it out a deal, we're fine, let's just have no deal. Mm. So that populism came after the 2016 referendum, whether that informed then the debate and in, in, in how the UK negotiated with us. Mm. It informed the context for the UK negotiators to work with us. And it wasn't easy, right? Ollie Robbins, the lead negotiator, there were bullets delivered to his home, right? Mm. There were this atmosphere of He's, why are these negotiations taking so long? This guy is not. This guy is betraying our country. It's very frightening in a way. No? So take us through one particular process to get the, one of the policy areas, and maybe the Northern Ireland hmm. one is something that, that people will be really interested in. Uh, it took very long. It's <laughs> I think that's my second last slide. Let me just go to the trilemma first for people who haven't followed the ins and outs. I think I brought it. Yeah. It was called a trilemma by, um, I forgot by whom, an academic, I think, or an expert. Dan Kelman. Thank you. Dan Excellent. Made this yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and so Theresa May said, we're leaving the single market, we're leaving the customs union. I'd promise number one. Automatically, that means goods going between the UK and the EU needs checks somewhere. Customs checks, because these can be products that come from China and there's maybe need to be tariffs need to be put on it, or regulatory checks. These may be products that do not re comply with EU standards on safety, pesticides, um, chemicals, so food safety standards and so on. So that's promise number one was that. Then there was a whole question, and this then becomes, the, the, in, in a way, a dilemma. <laughs> promise two, promise three. There will be no border between, on the left there, Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is what Theresa May, to her credit, always said, I will never entertain that option. I will never go down that route. Boris Johnson was different. He said, let's put the customs check somewhere on the island, he said. Theresa May said, for the peace process, the Good Friday Agreement, I will never accept border checks between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Given it's a trilemma, you can't have promise number two, no border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, or at least no checks between, and she didn't accept that. Ollie Robbins, her lead negotiator, astutely engaged with us, 
and we found some kind of solution, a soft Brexit, in October, November 18, which was a soft relationship in terms of trade and customs, unless and until we found something else. And that was subject to extremely stringent level playing field conditions. So the UK accepted the EU state aid regime, including the Court of Justice jurisprudence going forward, for as long as that solution applied. That was a big concession for us. And that's one of my favorite parts in the book, is where I then describe how our lead negotiator went to the ambassadors, and they were like, oh, really? Such a soft Brexit? And we had to say, but this is level playing field, it's there, so you don't need to be worried. We have all the level playing field, fair competition standards that you want. And so the member states came around to it. So we took a risk as a negotiating team. The flip side is in the UK, this betrays Brexit. This is not the Brexit we had thought we voted for. The EU is shackling us to their standards, to their institutions. We have been betrayed, we're trapped in the regulatory orbit of the UK. And so Theresa May never got her deal through. Partly also, and that then comes to why were they so not so good at negotiating? She never explained to the country what she was doing. I, th I admire her as a politician, I must say. We can talk about that. But as in terms of communicating with the country, I think that that wasn't the best. In, in but so anyway, that, that led to no, almost no deal because three times the parliament in Britain voted against that. Then Johnson came and signed up to a Northern Irish only solution. So promise one and promise three were kept. And therefore we went to, we need border checks somewhere between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. One week later, he goes to Northern Ireland, election campaign, has called an election and says, no checks, don't worry, if the, if, someone, if the EU asks you for checks, call me, we throw all these things in the bin. <laughs> in the book, I speak the last conversation between Juncker and Johnson, uh, Juncker uh, on the phone, and Johnson said, can't we do something about these checks? And Juncker said, no. And John said, okay, I'll th the second last conversation, nine in the morning, so I'll think about it. 11 o'clock, he calls back, says, fine, we'll do it. One week later, he says the opposite on the campaign trail. And that then led to the UK using, trying to use Northern Ireland for future relationship discussions. My reading is that Frost, who signed up to this, and Johnson thought, okay, well, let's sign up now. We'll never do this, but we'll change it in the future relationship, which didn't happen. So then we come to January 21, where the UK is not complying with what it had said it would do. And so we almost started litigation. Luckily, in the end, Sunak van der Leyen found a, a new deal where the relationship, partly driven by geopolitics and Ukraine war, people said, well, we can't be in a relationship of litigation. That's absurd. EU-UK. Can't we get out of this spiral of negativity where the EU says, you're not complying what you said. UK says, we don't want to comply with what, so. And luckily, all this changed, but you, it changed because of events, right? Partygate, Johnson had to go, Ukraine war. So it's quite interesting to reflect on that. The Windsor framework has basically, promise one, promise three is still there. And we, as an EU, we stretched as much as possible, softening these border checks. We have now a red and a green lane. Certain products only stay in Northern Ireland. They go through the green lane, so there's less, fewer checks, basically. Whereas those that come into Belfast and are at risk of going to the rest of the single market go to a red lane and are more subject to more stringent, uh, stringent controls. But for me, the remarkable thing is the unity of the EU in support of Ireland throughout all this. Yeah. 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 It's important, I think, obviously, hmm. for Northern Ireland. If one saw that at, at certain points there were, violence was beginning to uh, tick up. Mm -hmm. People were very afraid that, that Northern Ireland would explode again. So. And Brexit has polarized Northern Ireland. There's still no executive today in, in Northern Ireland. There was an executive till January 17. Then throughout the negotiations, there was no executive in Northern Ireland. So an ex the executive is the government of Northern Ireland, their devolution where the two rival parties, Sinn Féin, the Democratic Unionist Party, have very different views on the future of Northern Ireland in terms of the constitutional issue, 
where, where Northern Ireland belongs, have to work together, basically. Yeah. And Brexit has made it so much more complicated for them to work together. So thank you. Please join me in, in thanking